Now, you mentioned in, in the book, obviously, PGC-1 Alpha is this sort of master regulator. Can you discuss how, you know, the, the role of that and how it's uh, allowing for some of these adaptations to take place? Yeah, sure. So PGC-1 Alpha is just a protein in muscle. It's called a transcriptional co-activator. It's, it's very important in uh, inducing mitochondrial biogenesis or literally creating uh, more, more mitochondria. You know, people might remember from their high school or university textbooks and they think of mitochondria as these two-dimensional bean-shaped structures where in reality it's, it's a much more elegant structure than that. It's almost like a, a capillary network. And so when we talk about uh, mitochondrial biogenesis, really what we're talking about is expansion of an existing network. You could think of a, a garden hose literally growing more, um, uh, you know, uh, growing uh, larger in, in, in size and developing uh, more tubes, if you will. That's really what mitochondrial biogenesis uh, entails. And PGC1 alpha is a very important protein that uh, coordinates that process. And so it's often deemed the master regulator uh, because it's such an important protein and it, um, it is involved in the activation of many different other proteins that are all involved in mitochondrial biogenesis. And so, for example, in our lab, we've been interested in PGT1 alpha and we've shown that these short, hard bursts of interval exercise can elicit the same activation or increase in PGC1 alpha as we normally see with uh, a much larger amount of traditional endurance type exercise. And that's uh, obviously a major point in this whole story is the idea that in, in far less time we can induce some incredible adaptations, whether for the average folks trying to improve their health or even in, you know, athletes. And, you know, in your book, you mentioned the evolutionary context. And I recently had uh, Dr. Stefan Guiené on, who's a neuroscientist and obesity expert. He mentioned how we're sort of driven, the body and brain are driven to seek out calorically dense foods. And, of course, in your book, you mentioned the Harvard paleoanthropologist, Dr. Daniel Lieberman, who also t describes this idea of, you know, humans evolving to avoid exercise exercise. And I know a lot of people say, well, I just don't like longer bouts of exercise. And of course, it seems like this could be just an inherent um, evolutionary adaptation, no? To want to conserve? Uh, yeah, it could be. You know, it was uh, also pointed out by uh, Alan Batterham, who we um, interviewed for the book, who's uh, an exercise physiologist at Teesside University in the UK. And, uh, you know, Alan made the um, insightful point that there's no real biological drive to exercise, not like, for example, a biological drive to consume food or to have sex, for example. Uh, there's not that seeming innate biological drive to demand that we be uh, physically active. And, and so, you know, given um, our Western society today and how we've largely tried to engineer physical activity out of our lives, we're, we're seeing the manifestations uh, of, of that. But I, I think there's certainly some important evolutionary principles at, at play, you know, to, to draw the con to that. Um, maybe one of the reasons that some people uh, might like interval training more is it resembles more natural play. So if you watch children in a playground, they don't sort of jog in place for 45 minutes at a moderate pace. They run and hop and skip and jump. And so there's a, a school of thought from behavior perspective that at least for some people they might enjoy this type of exercise more because it more resembles natural play.